doing tonight? We're good? Yeah? All right, man, I'm excited, nervous, all sorts of emotions tonight. I get to uh, preach the message tonight, and I'm looking forward to whatever God is going to do uh, inside of your heart, in your life, and not just tonight, but what he does throughout the rest of this week for you. Um, so quickly, let's jump into it. When you hear the word legend, what comes to mind or who comes to mind? LeBron James, okay. Somebody better than that? MJ, thank you so much. Who else? Pastor Ozzy. He's not here. We'll have to say it again later. Anybody else? Huh? AB? That's a legend right there. All right, so when you think about that, we think about athletes, we think about maybe a celebrity, somebody who's making a difference, right? Um, why are they considered superstars or legends or exceptions to what is average? What makes them stand out? It's their dedication, their discipline, their effort. It's their talents. Um, it's how they get involved with society and, and, in, these, and in these generations. The interesting thing about these people is that they weren't born great. They weren't born already superstars. In fact, they didn't, their, their parents didn't even know they were going to be super, superstars. For some of them, their parents left them at such a young age and maybe now see them on the big screen and kind of regret not being the father or the mother to that child. They weren't born this way. They were developed. Considering their greatness and your admiration for them, what would you do if all of a sudden those doors open up and, like, LeBron James, walk, LeBron James walks in? You kind of just look over and just keep on listening to the preaching, right? Of course not. You're going to run to the back, take out your phone, take some pictures, maybe go live and show it to your friends. Right? If a Michael Jordan were to walk in or some sort of uh, professional athlete walks in, you're going to make your way to them. Why? Because you know that you are in the same building as greatness. Right? I got another question for you. Have you ever been on a date, but then it kind of got canceled because they left you hanging? Show of hands, anybody? Be honest. A few of you? Okay. Uh, Pastor D, please get the names down. There's counseling for you throughout the week. On the flip side, if you want to be super honest, because we're in church and we can't lie, have you ever left anybody hanging out on a date? Some of us are just like, oh. <laughs> Some of us are guilty of that. There is a place called hell, and uh, I'm joking. <laughs> Can I tell you right now that God is not man that he would leave us hanging. God is not somebody who would keep himself distant from you. He's somebody who is present in this room. He is faithful. The Bible says that he does not leave us and he does not forsake us. He is a God who's always present for your life and for my life. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. You could be the worst of sinners or feel like you're the worst of sinners. And God is still present. He's still there for you. He's here right now. He's faithful and he shows up and he always shows up into our lives. The Bible says that God is omnipresent. In other words, he is everywhere at the same time. When we go through the Old Testament, God often used nature to make himself known. We see that God moved through, through, for example, for Moses in a burning bush by parting the Red Sea, through smoke, through clouds, through fog. He would use the birds, the wind, the storms. He would use all sorts of different things to make himself known. And in the New Testament, John says this. So in the Old Testament, God would make himself known through a lot of times through nature. But in the New Testament, John says this. John chapter 1, verses, one uh, verses 14, it says, The word became flesh, speaking about Jesus, and made his dwelling among us. In other words, he came from heaven down to earth. And we have seen his what? Glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And another occasion, Jesus said, if you believe, you will see the what? The glory of God, John eleven forty. 40. So tonight, I want to talk about that. We hear the word glory, we hear it um, mentioned often, 
and we hear the word presence, what is the difference if there's any difference in that? If God is omnipresent, then his presence is everywhere at the same time. He is here right now, right? So what about his glory? His glory is the demonstration or the manifestation of his presence. His glory is his presence in action. His glory is the move of his presence. Glory in its, origin, in its original text means weight, heavy, abundance. So weight, heavy, or abundant. That is what glory means. Have you ever seen somebody so good at a job that they do at a trade or at a talent, a gifting, a sport? And what do we see? What do we say, especially as Hispanics? Está pesado, está tremendo, right? You hear those type of phrases? What does that mean? There's, there's a lot of weight to what they do. So when we speak about the presence of God and the presence of God on the move in your life, that is the weight of his glory that is moving inside of your life. Can I tell you something tonight? It's possible to be in the same building where the presence of God abides but not feel his glory. It's possible to be here tonight, sit in here for an hour and a half, and leave the exact same way that we stepped in here. Why? Because we missed out on his glory. But the Bible says this, James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When we look at the New Testament, when Jesus was around a lot of people, not everybody got touched by his glory. Not everybody experienced a healing, a miracle, a sign, a wonder. Not everybody's life was transformed. Why is that? Because he, even though he was surrounded by people, there was only a few who believed. And when they believed, they saw the glory or the fullness, the abundance, the weight of his presence. There's a story in the Bible, Martha and Mary, they invite Jesus over, Jesus visits them, but only one got to experience Jesus. Martha was so caught up trying to arrange the whole house while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Only one was drawn to Jesus. The, only, the other one was occupied or busy trying to have everything ready for Jesus. But I want you to know tonight that you don't have to have it all together. Just sit at the feet of Jesus. Be drawn to him and he will draw near to you. Move closer to him and the glory begins to show up in your life. So why is it that we can show up to a service, an event, a conference, but leave the same way? Because for some of us, it's tough to let him increase and see our lives decrease. For some of us, it's hard to surrender and let go of some things. But can I tell you that God's desire for your life tonight is that we just not be here in this building, but that we would have an encounter with him. Can I tell you that he wants to make himself known? He wants to make himself known to your life. And you know what's super crazy? That there is enough of God to fill and overflow inside of each of our hearts right now. I'll say that again so you can process it. There is enough of God to fill and overflow inside of each of our lives. There is enough of God. If you think your sin is great, God is greater. If you think your depression is great, God is greater. If you think your anxiety is great, God is greater. If you think your family dysfunction is great, God is greater. There is enough of him to fill and overflow in your life. Why? Because not only his presence is here, but his glory begins to move. So what do we do when his glory shows up, which is the title of my message tonight? What do we do when his glory shows up? Number one, his glory is acknowledged. His glory can only move where he's invited. His glory can only move where he is honored. His glory can only move when he is acknowledged, when he is recognized. I explain it like this. Have you ever overheard your name pop up in somebody else's conversation? Yeah? At the very least, now you become super hypersensitive to what they're talking about, right? It's like, are they talking good things about me? 
Are they saying bad things about me? At the very least, you're a little bit more sensitive to that. Um, if you're a little bit hood, then you get close to them and, hey, I heard my name. What's going on? It's, y'all want to invite me in or not? And it's like, chill out. We're not saying anything bad. Well, yeah, but my name was involved, so I guess that's an invitation, right? Now it's a party of three. That's what it sounds like. Or has it ever happened to you where um, you see people talking, all of a sudden both of them turn and look at you? And it's like, okay, what are they saying about me? Like, am I dressed weird? Do I have something on my face? Did, did I do something wrong? Or what's going on? What's happening in this moment? You are acknowledged. So when God is present everywhere, we still have to invite him into our lives. When you speak his name, he shows up. When you declare his word, he shows up. When he's acknowledged, he shows up. When he is honored, he shows up. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to travel out uh, to a friend's wedding. And um, as we were flying out of the valley, there was a Cuban lady who asked uh, a couple for directions or for help. And I could tell this lady was not from here, first of all, her accent. Second of all, she asked in Spanish, um, where, when do we land in Texas? And I was like, well, lady, we're flying out of Texas. I realized she was an undocumented person who was traveling out towards Arizona. And the couple in their short Spanish words were sort of able to orient her. And I remember I prayed while we were in line boarding the plane. And I said, Lord, if you give me an opportunity, give me the opportunity to serve her. And so it turns out this plane was packed out. I was one of the last ones to board the plane. They were one of the last ones to board the plane. And so I sit on my window seat. I have two seats next to me. And the lady walks up. And she's like, is anybody sitting here? I'm like, no, it's free. So I think she's going to sit on the aisle seat, leaving a space in between us. No, she sits right next to me. I'm just like, well, this is awkward. Like, thanks, God. Like, I prayed. You answered. Here we are. So uh, it was even more weird because this lady, she was not too familiar with the way things were going, uh, the way the plane was flying and the direction, nothing like that. So I start showing her the map. And she does this thing to where she starts leaning into me. And I'm just like, it's, it's, it's super weird. Like, I don't know you. And so uh, 20 minutes before we land, after a, a small talk and stuff like that, she asked me, do you work or do you study? I was like, well, I'm working. She's like, why aren't you studying? I was like, well, I didn't finish. Well, what do you want to study? I was like, look, I want to either do, I told her, look, I've been doing ministry most of my life. But I want to finish schooling in something either involved with sports therapy or sports psychology. And she's like, why is that? And I told her it's because um, I, I, I love the area of, of, of medical school. I love that whole medical field, um, helping people with their injuries and recovering, all that type of stuff. It, it, it catches my attention. She's like, well, you're going to have to choose ministry or sports therapy. You can't do both. I was like, well, here's the interesting thing. My plan is to be involved in school as I have been with FCA for some time. And I explained to her what that was. And I told her, look, now more than ever, these kids, they don't just need to be healed physically. They need to be heard and they need for their minds and their hearts to heal as well. And what better person to do it than somebody who has faith and trust and communication with the Lord? See, my goal is not just to step into school to help somebody heal physically. My goal is for them to have an encounter with the heart of God. It may or may not make sense to you, lady, but that is my heart. And immediately I felt the glory of God. This lady's eyes began to tear up in that moment. And she's like, I don't know what it is, but you're you're different. I've never heard of this type of stuff. I was like, "I I just love God and I love people. She's like, yeah, no, I, I, it, that makes sense. And, and um, you would think you'd have to separate both, but, but, but you're different. Please guard your heart because what you're carrying is, is, is rare. It's not seen anywhere. I was like, oh, my gosh. And so in that moment, I knew that God was present. Not just because he's everywhere, but because he was being glorified. His name was being mentioned. He was being praised and he was honored. When we talk about him, we invite him into our midst. Exodus 33 verses 15 through 19. You can go and check it out later on. 
Moses speaking to God um, and God speaking to Moses, it tells us that God's glory is his goodness, his name, his mercy, his compassion. So guess what? When you speak about his goodness, his glory shows up. When you speak about his name, his glory shows up. When you exercise mercy, his glory shows up. When you live out a compassionate life, his glory shows up. Why? Because that is who he is. And when we mention him, when we acknowledge him, he has no other choice but to make himself known through his glory. It's his presence being known. Number two, his glory is experienced. His glory is experienced. We don't just acknowledge him, but you and I also have the opportunity to experience who God is. But sometimes if we're honest, especially nowadays in the social media world that we live in, it's so easy for us to focus on a conference speaker or on the next best song or on the next best worship team. And, and, and we honor them because they've experienced the glory of God. But what about us? Isn't it the same God? Isn't it the same presence? Isn't it the same weight of his glory? If God can touch that big conference speaker, he can touch your life as well. If God can use Maverick City, he can use your life as well. If God can use Pastor Charlie, Pastor Ozzy, and all the leaders that step up here, he can use your life as well. It is the same God. See, the truth is that it's not the songs that set us free. And we can't blame the preacher when our bad habits don't leave our lives either. The transformation does not happen on the next big song or the next big preacher. It happens when you choose to experience heaven meeting earth. When you choose to speak about God's kingdom and allow his kingdom to reign in your life. You see, when his glory comes, addictions are broken. When his glory comes, anxiety becomes peace. When his glory comes, the blind begin to see. When God's glory shows up, even the dead are raised to life. When his glory comes, even depression becomes, depression becomes joy. If you haven't laughed for a while, let God's glory invade your heart. If you haven't smiled genuinely for a while, let his glory invade your heart. If life has been tough, let his glory invade your heart. Because his glory is more than just a hype. It's more than posting my story. It's much bigger than that. If we're honest... Gina and Celine Dion can belt the biggest notes and we'll feel chills and all these goosebumps and all these types of things. But nothing changes. Why? Because Gina can't save you. Celine Dion can't bring salvation to your heart. It is the glory of God that sets us free. It is the glory of God that sets us free. Jesus on several occasions said this. He said, this illness... Is for the glory of God. And another occasion he said this death is unto the glory of God. What did this mean? He said, it may seem like a bad situation, but this is an opportunity for God's abundance to show up. This is an opportunity for the fullness of who Jesus is to, make, to be known for each of these people involved. It's for the glory of God. In all of this, I want to tell you that when we talk about experiencing God's presence, there must be a resolve in our hearts to not just want to be in the room with Jesus, but to want to be face to face with him. Not just be in the room with him, be face to face with him. When you look at the book of John, John writes, and he's a little bit prideful, he says, the beloved disciple of Jesus. He speaks about himself. As being the beloved disciple whom Jesus loves. But in John 13, 13 and in 21, 20, it tells us that John was so close to Jesus that he would rest his head on Jesus' shoulder, on Jesus' chest. I mean, you can do that to anybody, but the man that is full of the glory of God, you get to hear his heartbeat. Can you imagine that? Last night as I was studying this, I was so moved by that because 
Man, we, we, we can be so busy in our day, but Jesus, Jesus made the invitation for your life and for me. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. What was John doing? He was resting on the glory of God. How much more intimate do you want to be with Jesus? Find rest in who he is. Experience his peace. Experience his rest. Our days are not getting any easier. Society is not getting any holier. Things are getting much worse. Hey, we got, we got to find time to find rest in who he is. Find rest in his glory. There's a reason why he said if you're heavy burdened. In other words, you can either carry your weight or you can rest on the heaviness of my glory. What do you want? It's time that we would experience his glory. It's time that we experience his movement. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus speaking to not an unbeliever. He speaks to a church, a dry church. And he says this, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. What was Jesus saying to this church? Hey, if you would just open up, if you would just listen, if you'd be sensitive to what I'm doing, we would be able to have a relationship. We would be able to be connected. And maybe that's what Jesus is saying to maybe some of our hearts tonight. At some point you were on fire for the Lord. At some point you were reading your Bible, you were praying, you were fasting, God was speaking to you and, and you were having dreams and, and, and God was using you in very special ways. But something happened that you may be straight off path. Something happened that you grew cold. But I tell you tonight that his presence is here. And he stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And he says, man, if you just be sensitive to what I'm saying to you tonight. And you would open up, I would come in. I would dwell with you and you would dwell with me. And we can start that fire once again. We can revive that passion once again. We can find purpose once again. We can live in direction and, and passion once again. His glory is to be experienced. Number three, his glory is shared. But the Bible says that God does not share his glory. So what does this mean? What God is saying is no one can take my credit. Instead, give me credit in all that you do. Does that make sense? It's so easy for us to take credit when you studied so hard and you ace, ace that exam. It's so easy for us to take credit when you've worked so hard and, and you hit a new personal record in the gym or in your sport. It's so easy for us to take credit when we've invested so much time and we finally got that promotion. It's so easy to take credit when, hey, you've been talking to this girl, this guy for a while and finally you guys are engaged or you're in a relationship. It's so easy for us to take credit for these types of things. However, what God was saying or what, what God is saying when it comes to sharing his glory. It's to say, hey, anything that you do, let it point back to me. Because it's only in me that you live and you breathe and you, and, and you walk. It's only in me. The truth is that all of us have been designed to give credit to all of who he is. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13, 13 through 16. I'm going to almost close out. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus speaking, he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its sal saltiness, how can, it be made, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out trample, and trampled underfoot. 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, your life is meant to be a representation of God before people. All that you do is supposed to be a representation of God's glory working in your life. What does this mean? This means that when God touches your heart, you share it with somebody else. 
This means that when God blesses your life, now you're called to be a blessing to somebody else. When you were lost and now you're found, now you're called to lead somebody else to the feet of Jesus. And we get real practical, but at the same time kind of challenging. Can you imagine praying for a friend, God's glory shows up, and that person's healed? Can you imagine maybe a friend that is in crutches or has a sling over on, under his arm? Can you imagine just touching that person's arm or that leg and instantly their life is healed, their, their body's healed? What happened? God's glory showed up. Can you imagine praying for somebody who has cancer and all of a sudden the reports come back and, hey, you're clear. What happened? God's glory showed up. I remember a few years ago there was a, a young lady at my previous church who had an, an older father. And I remember her mom called me and said, Harvey, please come to the hospital. Bobby may not make it. There's only 30% chance of him living. So a friend and I went to the hospital. She stayed in the lobby area with the rest of the family. The family started pouring in, flying in from uh, Veracruz, from other parts of Mexico. Everybody was showing up for this man's funeral. And I remember that I went upstairs to this man's room where Bobby was, was laying in his bed. And his wife wakes him up and says, hey, Bobby, Har Harvey's here. And he's like, oh, hey, Harvey. I was like, that doesn't sound like 30%. And um, I was like, hey, Bobby, how are you doing? He's like, well, I mean, we're here. We're here. And the wife stepped out. And I was like, you know what, Bobby, let's go ahead and pray. So we began to pray for this man. And when we finished praying, there was, I could just see a joy in this man's life, in this man's face. He was talking, having conversation. He was energetic. Harvey, I'm going to get out of here. And I'm going to be at church on a few Sundays. Just wait. Just watch. It's like, all right, Bobby. So I come back downstairs. And the family is in panic. They're crying and everything. The wife approached me. How did it go? What's, what's going on? It's like, he's fine. Well, what, what do you mean? Like, he's, no, he, he's good. Are you sure? I was like, yeah, he's fine. We leave the place, talk to my friend, and she says, were you lying to that family? I was like, no, what do you mean? She's like, these people are freaking out. They're crying. This, this man's going to die. It's like, he's not going to die. Well, what do you mean? Like, we prayed. We believed. We put him in God's hands, and the man's well. Fast forward a couple of weeks, Bobby shows up to church on a Sunday morning with his wife holding his arm, with his daughter walking with him. It, it wasn't Harvey. It was the glory of God that manifests himself in that bedroom. These are the things that God does. These are stories that they didn't happen 50 years ago, 100 years ago. No, this just happened a few years ago. That airplane story happened a few weeks ago. This tells me that God is still active. He's still moving and he still wants to use your life. So what are we going to do about it tonight? His presence is here. His glory wants to move. Where's your heart at tonight? Let's stand to our feet. Tonight, I want you to picture in your mind, close your eyes for a few moments. You're about to go back into school. You're going to go back to work tomorrow. You're going to go to your family tonight. Can you imagine extending your hand praying for the sick and they're healed? You're about to go into school. You're going to go to work tomorrow. Can you imagine having a conversation with an atheist and they're saved at that moment? They believe and they see the glory of God. You're going to go to bed tonight. Can you imagine going to bed and worshiping the Lord and your dad finally wakes up sober after a long time? Can you imagine your parents' marriage being restored? A romance begins once again. There's no more dryness in your home when his glory shows up. Can you imagine walking the hallways of your school and people are drawn to you, but not because it's you, but because it's Jesus in you. Because there's a weight of glory that has descended over your life. See, God is not distant, church. James said if we would just draw near to him, he would draw near to us. 
when we couldn't make our way to heaven, heaven came down to earth. And the Bible says that the earth is full of his glory. And the fullness of his glory is Jesus Christ in your heart. So if Jesus abides in your heart and you abide in him, why not release the power, the authority, the goodness, the mercy, the compassion that he has deposited already in your heart? You just have to exercise it. My God, you're good, you're faithful. Lord, I'm a mess. I'm broken. Lord, I'm empty. Lord, I feel dry. I feel cold. I feel indifferent. But tonight, Lord, I understand that you're just not omnipresent. You want intimacy, my God, and you want to manifest your glory. You want to demonstrate your power in my life and through my life. Lord, if there's anything in me that you can use, here I am. Tonight, you might feel disqualified because of your past, because you feel you bring nothing to the table, because of what you've done, even a sin that you committed earlier today. But can I tell you that that is the very thing that qualifies you to experience his glory, his goodness, his mercy, his compassion. The prodigal son, even though he was away, he still had one father. All he had to do was come back to his father. That lost coin, even though the coin was lost, it still had value and it only had one owner. That one sheep that was lost, it still had one shepherd and that shepherd came back to find that one lost sheep. How do we get to the father? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I have come that you would have life and have it in abundance. The altar is open for anybody who wants to step up. Say, Lord, here's my life. I want you. I need you. I don't want to be the same way that I stepped in here. Lord, here's my life. I'm a mess, I'm broken, I'm hurting, I'm depressed, I'm feeling anxious, Lord. But if what your word says is true, then I need your glory right now to move. Lord, I am struggling with temptations, but if what your word says is true, my God, then I need the weight of your glory right now. Lord, I'm struggling between good influences and bad influences and, and, and good friends and not so good friends. Lord, but if what your word says is true... I need your glory right now. Come on, lift up your voice.